Where's my pick? You'll never know, huh? What are we gonna play? So now we can start. <coughs> I don't know who else is watching. Was he Zahav is there? Somebody else there? We have Pesha Rachel here, and Arya is here, and I'm here. It, it sounds funny. On Shabbos, I was counting how many spaces we had at the Shabbos table, and I miscounted because I didn't count myself. <coughs> Let's see, I said this clock. Okay, so for my mother, first of all, I forgot to say Shalom Aleichem to my mother last week. So I'm making up for that this week, and she'll probably say, why is my hair not cut? And that's because we had two months of Adar, and I'm waiting to cut my hair, so I don't have to cut it again before Pesach. And uh, it's getting very long. Like, my hair doesn't get long, it gets big. Um, let's see, I don't want to knock over the camera, but something is off here. Okay, whatever. We're going to live with it. So we're learning from Torah Hay, and we're going to finish either tonight. Purim is coming. Yes, Purim is coming. Yeah, El is there. We're going to finish either tonight or next week. Is that the Shem? And uh, tonight we're probably going to get to Rabbi Bar Bar Chana, which whenever we get to that in a lesson that Kutim on, you know that he's summarizing the whole lesson. <coughs> um, be gentle there. So, of course, you remember what the lesson is about because we learned it so many times. But it's amazing how the Yetzirah comes and makes you forget. So just in case you don't remember, I'll give a short overview of the lesson. Let somebody uh, knocking into the window here. So here I have this paper here. But I'm going to knock over the camera. Never mind, it's fine. Um, just trying not to move the table too much. So we started off at the Chatzotot V'kol Shofar. I can, I can say it by heart at this point. Um, the blowing of the Shofar and the blowing of the trumpets. This is then on Rosh Hashanah and then the Beit HaMikdash. And Rabbi Nachman then brings in uh, the quote from Sanhedrin. Tzarich kol adam lomar, kol haolam lo nivra ele bishvili. Everybody has to say that the whole world was created just for me. And with that, he goes on and brings out this whole big lesson. It is going to bother me, but I don't know what to do. But you're going to get something, are you? No. Okay. Um, this whole big lesson about how the whole world was created for you so that you could fulfill your purpose and you can daven for other people. And what does it mean to daven for other people? You found something? Mm -hmm. Okay, that side. Shukoch. Yeah, that's probably fine. That's good. Thank you very much. Okay, what does it mean to daven for other people? So there's two ways of davening. There's the davening that it's like a straight arrow, easy. There's no obstacle. And then there's the davening where you feel like you're, there's a certain sadness connected to it. 
And he goes on and expands this whole thing. We talk about um, the joy, the, the, the essence of joy is in the heart. And sometimes the heart is crooked. And why is the heart crooked? Because we filled it with foreign thoughts, with ways of looking at the world that doesn't, uh, uh, here Katie's watching also, Shalom that doesn't include Hashem. And so we have to straighten out the heart. And how do we straighten out the heart? By davening with enthusiasm and energy and bringing in this fear and, uh, and love of God. And then we create a thunder. And this thunder strikes our mind and straightens out. It basically it gives you a little hit and straightens out your thinking. Then he brings the concept of matzah and chametz, which it's interesting. I'm learning now in the morning. We're learning, I don't even remember, Torah Nun something, one of those. And we're in the middle of, of this very long Torah. <coughs> and he starts talking about chametz and matzah, exactly what we're learning in this lesson here. That the difference between chametz and matzah is a mashuhu. So, of course, after Purim, even though Purim never actually ends, but after we are elevated by the day of Purim, we're now in the 30-day rush to the Seder because all of the holidays are set, are set up with 30 days between them. So, I don't know what it is. We have uh, 90 days now or 60 days normally from Hanukkah, and then we have Purim, and then we have 30 days until Pesach, and then we have, uh, well, 50 days until Shavuot, and then we have like another... 60 days till Elul, and then we have 30 days until Rosh Hashanah. And I think it works like that, that we're always pretty much a month or two months away from the next holiday, except for, uh, you know, the big holidays in Tishrei, which they come one right after the other. So here we have Chametz and we have Matzah. And the difference between them, they use the same letters, the difference between them is the little tiny um, gap in the letter He. And so Rabbi Nachman then talks about Chametz and how you can sour your thinking and that you can allow the evil energy to come into your mind and to mess things up for you <coughs> and prevent you from being able to daven, which is the purpose of all the creation so that you can fill what's lacking in the world. And um, here, Pesha Racha listens to the podcast, so you'll hear a story related to that on the podcast this week and anybody else who listens to the podcast, but I'm not telling the story here tonight. And uh, oh, yeah, the podcast this week, I didn't, have, I didn't have time Sunday to record it. Yesterday, I wasn't feeling well. Today, I got to work at like 4.30 in the afternoon, crazy, and record the story and start editing it, and then I got to come to class. So hopefully I'll finish it. Of course, I'll finish it on time tomorrow. But there he talks about um, living your purpose, serving Hashem with joy, not having the, the, your thoughts turned to chametz, and that's pretty much where we are. <coughs> Bless you. Okay, so chametz and matzah. And then he also brings in matzah. Matzah, the, it connects it to the fights between tzaddikim, that they're not actually fights, that they're there in order to uh, help you listen to two tzaddikim argue and say, oh, what do I have to fix within myself? And use that as a, as a, like a tool for introspection. And then remember last week I brought the paper with uh, the time for the last time you're allowed to say Shema in the morning, which uh, there's the Shita of the Gra, the, Gilna, the Vilna Gaon, and the Alta Rebbe, who were opponents to such a degree that the Vilna Gra, or at least his students, convinced the Russian government to put the Alta Rebbe in prison and they wanted to kill him. But it wasn't really a fight between them. It was the fight between Sadiqim is not what we see on the surface. Okay. After he clarified that we have to include love with fear and awe for two reasons. Because before he was talking about how you have to be really strict with yourself and you have to daven with this gavura and this stringency and to like really put all of this uh, disciplined energy into your davening, he says, wait, don't get stuck there because you also have to bring in the love. 
Because if it's all love, it doesn't work, and if it's all stringency, it doesn't work. So you have to bring the two for two reasons. Kedei she'akol haba meyira ve'gvura yachdo et atimut hamoach. In order that the sound that's coming out of your mouth when you're davening from a place of fear and, and um, discipline will penetrate the blockages in your mind. And for this you need a love of Hashem. That it activates the revelation of the mind it takes it out of its blockage. It like, takes off the, the cloud that's covering it. And bet, k'day she yitze hara me'amoach, in order for the thunder, the thunderous voice of your davening, to come out from your mind, ki ha'moach ve'aram heim shnei ha'vachim, because the mind and the thunder of the davening are two opposites. Ha'moach hu chasadim, the mind is compassion, meaning the mind is calm, Varam Gvura and the the thunder is like shaking fear, stringency, discipline. Velachen Saikh Lichlol et Yira Vava Yachad. So you have to bring these two together. The fear and the love together. Nimza Shikar It Gabrut Hi Alideava. And so how do we overcome the crookedness in the heart? We have to bring in love. Now he's going to bring a verse to prove it, and then we're going to have a little bit of um, an explanation of it. And then we're going, I just translated the whole Rabbi Barbarchana because it's complicated and it's in Aramaic. So if it's in Aramaic, we might as well read it in English. It's the same thing. Unless there's a native Aramaic speaker here, then it'd probably be easier for them. And this is what it's written. So this is a phrase that comes up in Chabad Chassidus. There's a, there's a whole mimer based on this, that the, the flood waters or the many waters are not able to extinguish the love. So here he says, These are the nations of the world. The meaning the negative energy in the world. So what does that mean? That means that you're not looking at things in a Jewish way, you're looking at things only in a Tony Robbins way. Not to put down Tony Robbins, but, but uh, we've had some Tony Robbins in our house, I never went to any events, I never spent any money on Tony Robbins, we've had books and videos and all that, and that's, I have a little idea of what Tony Robbins does. He never, I never heard him talk about God. And certainly not having faith in Hashem, you know, he's very practical, He's very tachless and he's very like trying to help people with the tools that he has. And a person can get caught up in that way of thinking and forget about bringing Hashem into the picture. My wife is learning from Shara Bitachon. I don't remember which rabbi. Do you remember the rabbi that wrote it? I don't remember his name. But it was written, uh, I don't know, in the 1400s or something like that. And thinking, thinking, thinking. How much was that yeshiva education worth? Okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The rabbi want, doesn't want us to remember his name. Anyhow, he wants to be humble. So it's fine. <coughs> so there... <coughs> this is Shara uh, B'Tachon? Yeah, it's probably... I don't know. She's reading it, and she just keeps quoting passages, passages to me. So she said, we have the... What's it called that turns metal into gold? Um, alchemist. Thank you. The alchemist. <coughs> And the alchemist, I don't know if there ever really was an alchemist, but the idea between al- of the alchemist is that you'll be able to take a cheap metal and turn it into gold, and then you'll be wealthy, and anytime you needed gold, you just did your little mixing of chemicals, and you've got your gold. And he says, what's the difference between somebody that has faith in Hashem and the alchemist? The difference is the person that has faith in Hashem never runs out of materials, whereas the alchemist can only rely on whatever materials you stocked up. I can relate to that because I'm making glazes for ceramics and I ran out of materials and I placed an order and it turns out there's a shortage in the whole country and it's been like three months and they still haven't filled the order. And so I keep throwing stuff on the wheel. That's what's called throwing stuff. Now I'm not actually throwing stuff. I'm throwing the clay and pulling things up. Um, 
<laughs> that I don't have enough glaze material to glaze all the stuff. So that's, that would be the alchemist. But what's the person that has faith in Hashem? Uh, the, the resource of emuna and bitachon and Hashem is endless. And so that would be the mayim rabim lo bot ta'ava. That the world and all of the problems in the world can never squash the love, meaning the, the faith in Hashem, or here what he's bringing specifically love, because we're talking about love and fear. So that would be a, like a non-Jewish way of thinking, would be to forget that Hashem is running the world. Um, I should say, in the, in the Chabad teaching, just in case you don't want to read it, what does it mean? It means that you, oh, it really comes back to the same thing, that you have faith in Hashem, even in the midst of all your worldly problems. That's the Mayim Rabim. Hainu, that is to say, She'im yitpanu ava im ha'yira. If you bring together love with the fear, Azaya sitra cha, then the negative energy in the world, kvar lo tuchal lahachmis et mochenu, lachmitz et mochenu. Then the negative energy in the world is not able to sour our minds. So basically, if you have these two together, you are protected against the negative energy. But you have to be vigilant because it's easy to let it go. Because the main way of overcoming in the battle against, in the war against the negative energy in the world, meaning the Yetzirah, it's through love. As it's written, Shev Lemini Vechule Adashit Oivecha Hadom Leglecha. So sit by my right side. This was a quote that he brought in the previous part of the lesson. Sit by my right side, and I will vanquish your enemies that will sit still next to your footstool. Kana. Meaning that when you bring these two together, there'll be like an automatic process that Hashem will help you to overcome the Yetzirah. So now we can think about it. Let's say a person is all gavura. They're very strict with themselves. Um, they only do, like they have to do certain things every day and they do that and they never have any flexibility whatsoever. So what would happen in a situation like that is somebody would eventually break. And then when they break, they don't want to do anything at all because they say, what, what happens when a person reaches that point? They just say, screw it all. I don't care about this, and I don't care about that, and I don't care about anything. And then to bring them back to where they were before, it's very hard. But if there's Ava with the Yira, then the person is very strict with themselves. But if they reach the end of the day and they realize that they couldn't actually do everything that they wanted to do, they're like, it's okay. Tomorrow, we'll get back to it. And that's the mixture of Yira and Ava. And then when you have that, then you can overcome the Yitzhara. If you just have ava, you're never going to overcome anything because you're just giving in to every desire that you have and every thought that you have. But if you only have gavura, you're also not going to be able to overcome it because at some point you're going to break yourself. When you bring the two together, I gave the example of the saw. You know, when you, do, when you saw a piece of wood, you don't want to put pressure on the saw. You let the saw do its work. And the same thing here. When you bring together love and fear, then let it do its work and Hashem will take care of Conquering the the Yitzhara. Shirak al Yideava Nitaher Hamoach mea Hamitsuto the Umitgale me atimuto U meakol naasim ramim. And it's only through love that the mind is purified and from its sourness and it and it re, the, the the blockage is removed. And the voice that comes out makes this thunderous sound that can straighten out your heart. So now he's bringing another proof text for this. Um, and I'm just going to go, I'm going to pass over this here because, you know, it's just, he's just trying to prove the point again and again. Like what he's saying, he's not just making it up here. There's proofs in the text. Let's see, we'll go to the... You still need the, the love because even with 
the gevura, even with the stringency, it doesn't make this sound that straightens out the the heart that that hits the mind and and from the mind it straightens out the heart. Okay. So now he's saying you have to bring in the love. Okay, Lama say in a practical way, a kavana. The intention is shekol shelotiet filato rak begvura shen yirat shemaim that a person's davening shouldn't only be just through the fear of heaven, ela b'shituf achesed shel avat Hashem, but rather with bringing in the kindness of the love of Hashem. Kedei sheyi. Uh, so that the, the sound that you make from your davening will penetrate into your mind. That is the sound that comes out when you're davening, which is connected to chokhmah, which is wisdom, which is thinking. So that it will make... Um, the sound of thunder, v'itgaber al oivecha, and you'll conquer the sitra achra, meaning the yetzera, ve'yetzera, ha machmit et mochor bechokhmot chitzoniyot v'tahavot. What is the yetzera doing? He's coming and he's souring your thinking through secular ways of looking at the world and through unhealthy desires. This is the quote that we had before. Sit by my side and I'll conquer your enemies. And it, it follows that the intention of what we're saying here is In order to conquer, to be victorious over the enemy, and the enemy is the Yetzirah, it's not enough to just be gvuradik. It's not enough to be self-disciplined and strong. But you need the aspect of sit by the right side, but it's also yamin, smon dochav yamin mekarevit, which is what we had before, that the left hand pushes away, which is the gvura, and the right hand pulls in, which is the chesed. Shehi chesed, you have to have this combination of the two. And then after this thunderous sound is made in your mind, so then, so Lebanon is meaning a symbol of the heart. So there's going to be like this, these drops that come down from the mind into the heart. And they'll straighten out the crookedness of the heart. And a person can come to true, complete joy by maaseh mitzvot and doing the mitzvot. V'yelo ta'anu kol gadon ba'asiyat ha-mitzvah. The person will have such a great desire, such a great pleasure in doing the mitzvot. Ad she'lo yirtze shum sechar ocher to the point where a person won't want any other reward milvad lekayem od mitzvah. Except to do another mitzvah. And uh, I'm giving Pesher Achol a, a preview in the story. I actually bring this Torah in to one of the characters in the story. That, that's what happens a lot of time. I'm giving over the story, and I'm like, oh, that's the lesson that we're learning. So I'm going to have the character give over the lesson. So the, the woman of the, the guy in the story, he, she says, you know, this, this is the thing. You just want another mitzvah. Ve'im yir'eh b'pam acheret, and if a person sees another time, that the person doesn't have this joy. So we were talking about a person that does a mitzvah with such joy that all they want to do is like another mitzvah. It's like, um, I'm thinking about my cat. It's not, not even my cat, my kid's cat, but I take care of him way too much. And now my wife and I live in a cage because we had to block all the ways of him getting into our room because we don't actually have a room, just have a closet dividing the floor. Because when we moved in there, we had two kids and... You know, that's how life develops. So, Bezat Hashem, we're going to build another floor eventually, and we'll have a real room with a real wall and a real door, but for now, I had to cover it for the cat. So the cat, we have a toy, and you take this toy, it's like on a fishing pole, and it has a little thing on it, and he jumps around, and he runs around, and he never gets tired of it. Like, he wants more, and he wants more, and he wants more. So that's a stupid cat. But here, we're talking about mitzvot, 
So if a person gets to the point where they just like, throw the ball again, give me another mitzvah, give me another joyous thing. It's like if you eat a, a meal that the food is so good, you're like, I have to have another and another. And here you don't get full. So let's say you're on that level. But what happens if another time you don't have that joy? We said already, if a person sees that they don't have this joy, and another time doing mitzvot or davening, yavin ki asiba the the person will understand the reason for this is he bepnei sheyesh na ki biyachol atzvut etzel Hashem mitbarach. It's as if it were that the person has a sadness by Hashem. Mechimat shegazar ezek zera because there was some judgment passed in heaven. Viyavin mitoch komat a mitzvot. When a person will understand from doing the mitzvot, hechan nigzara hagzera ba'olam shana v'nefesh. How the decree was given, whether it's regarding the world, a time, or an individual, v'yeda kitzad la'albish et tefilato b'ma'amar u'besipur. And then a person will understand that they can't just daven directly for the person, but they have to do it in a roundabout way through either an everyday conversation or a story. So that's basically the end of the lesson until so now we, this all of this is um, the story of Rabbi Barbar Khana which we're going to start learning and then um, this is the end where he's just saying and this is the meaning of the opening phrase so we're probably not going to finish the whole thing tonight but we'll finish it by next week okay so Rabbi Bar Barachana re- recounted, one time we were traveling. So now you know Rabbi Bar Barachana, right? You know, you know who he is. <coughs> He's one of the rabbis in the Talmud. Uh, I don't know if he was uh, a Tana or a Mora. I don't, I don't know the difference between the two. Between them, I know one is before a certain time, one is after a certain time. I don't know which one he is. But he was like, he w- I, I understood that he was almost not put in the Gemara because he had these crazy stories. It was like he's just making stuff up. But it turns out that the stories, so Rabbi Nachman wanted to specifically take all of Rabbi Bar Barachana's stories, there's something like 26 or some number like that, 28, I don't remember, and use them all to explain the Kabbalah behind them. So that was like one of Rabbi Nachman's missions. He had a few missions. One of them was, there, you know, there was this huge blow to the European Jewish world after Shabtai Tzvi and Jacob Frank. And we even had a whole lesson, the Kutei Moran, about what they did and how it was wrong. They believed, so Shabtai Tzvi just was, said he was Mashiach. Jacob Frank, who came around, I think, 30, 40 years after him, he, was also, he also said he's Mashiach, but he took 20 something thousand of his followers and they became Christians because they had this idea that they were so holy that they could elevate Christianity by being Jews that became Christians. Completely warped way of thinking. And he was saying, you know, you got to be careful because this stuff can drag you into bad places. So one of the things that Rabbi Nachman wanted to do was repair kind of faith in the Jewish world and bring joy back to the Jewish world after the disasters like these. Also, there were huge uh, massacres in, the, in, in Eastern Europe, and that's why Rabbi Nachman is buried in Uman. I think there was 40,000, 50,000 people killed by um, the Chelmanitsky gang, and they were just like thrown into this river, this, this lake or something, and he wanted to be buried there so people wouldn't forget them. So, he saw his mission was like to, you know, bring back this joy. Also, Reb Shlomo, Shlomo Karbach, he said the same thing. So Shlomo really came out in the 50s, and that was right after the Holocaust. And he basically said Jews had lost their joy in being Jewish after the Holocaust. Now we're talking about Ashkenazi Jews, because Sephardi Jews didn't have the same experience. And so he had his nigunim, and he had his teachings, and the stories and all of this, he said his mission was to bring joy back to Judaism. I would say that Shlomo definitely succeeded in that area. Okay, so Rabbi Barbar Khanna told this story. One time we were traveling on a sfinta, on a ship. 
to sail between a fish's two, uh, what is it called, shitza, fins. It took the ship three days and three nights, even though it was swimming upwind and we were sailing downwind. So meaning that the fish was going with the, the stream, with the upstream, and they were going downstream. So they were, the fish was going at the maximum speed, and they were going at the maximum speed. Unless you think that the ship was not sailing quickly, when Rav Dimi came, he said, in the time it takes to heat a kettle of water, it went 60 parsecs. And a, par, a, a parsha, a rider, shot an arrow, but the ship was, went faster than the arrow. Just to show you how fit, fast the, the ship was going. <coughs> and Rav Ashi said, this fish was a sea Gildena, which has two fins. This is from Bava Batra 73b, in case you want to look it up afterwards. Sorry. Okay, so that's the story. And you can understand the rabbis didn't want to put this in the Gemara because they said this Rabbi Barbachana is out of his mind. What kind of crazy story is this? But Rabbi Nachman looks at it and he says, ah, all the secrets of this lesson are hidden right here in this crazy story. And now he breaks it down. Spinta, which is the ship, connotes importance. Now, he, so we have it in Hebrew here. I guess that would make some, it's really hard to combine the two. So I remember he brought here uh, Safun. Where is it? Oh boy, that's the whole story. Lashon Safon the Chashuv. I'm not sure if that's how you say it, Safon 165. Um, it says it's Chashuv. So see, we have Spinta. And that's the same letters as Safon, and that's why it's important. So I'm just going to go through this quickly. I think I'll try to get through <coughs> most of it tonight because um, it's still a little confusing. So Svinta connotes importance. It corresponds to the Gvor of fear. As is written, the fear of God is his treasure, for the fear of heaven is what's most important. So we're starting off with taking Svinta, the ship, and he's saying that's Gvura. Um, Shitsa is connotes misfortune, separate yourselves from the congregation, I'll, de I'll destroy them in an instant. And the Aramaic translation of this, ve vai ash shai yesh, I don't know what it is. Okay, they're saying um, that this, I don't know how, the, I don't, actually don't know how the misfortune is going to, oh, the misfortune because you're davening for somebody. So first we have the gvura. Then we have the misfortune because you're davening for somebody who needs to be davened for. And this corresponds to the mitzvot, which is divided. So this is three days and three nights. There are three categories, the rational, the traditional based, and the, mit the mitzvot, chukim, umishpatim. And it says, study them day and night. So we had three days and three nights. It was swimming upwind and we were sailing downwind. This corresponds to God rejoices in his works. All right. I, I don't know. I find this very uh, difficult to understand. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you don't. But uh, I want to I just move on a bit here. Let's see. Let's go to 182. And we'll just read from there. Okay. 182. Um, so that what we said was the Chukim and the Mishpatim Right, mitzvot. Nimtza shea mitzvot. Yesh nam b'chinat shlosha. Let's go on to the next one. Ihu hainu kadosh baruch hu hainu. Let me see here. You know what? It's very hard to explain this stuff. Because he's bringing the whole lesson into here, but he's bringing it in in a very, um, very intense way. And let's see if I can bring anything else. Maybe we'll just... Finish next week. Hainu shal yedei hamitzvot lamala tzlata yam yoma. I thought I was going to go through all of this and just read it, but I'm I'm reading it and it's just not uh, not flowing for me. Okay, you know what? Let's go here. Let's maybe we'll read the summary from here. Let's see if he even has it in here. Summary of Rabbi Barbar Khana. No, he doesn't even bring it in here. Okay, so I'm leaving it there. Okay, that's it. 
we're going to continue. We're going to finish the lesson next week because I didn't prepare the last piece because I was uh, expecting to read all of that. One second. Let's see if I can find a summary. The fish, Agila. Okay, let's go. That's the name of the fish. Shubchinat chibo shnei shemot halalu ba'ofen shenachshav et haot alef pa'amayim leshnei shemot. Hinei. Okay, so this means ata gibo leolam Hashem. That's the the name of the fish. Okay, I'm not I'm not seeing the connection here, so I'm just going to leave this alone. We're going to finish that next week. Okay, so I'll tell the story, and that's it. Sorry. It's kind of like the lesson came to like this crash. We get to the Rebbe Bar Bar Khana and, and really I, I did spend a lot of time studying it before and I was like, oh wow, this is really interesting and of course that connects to that. But then to try to teach it, it's uh, not working for me. <coughs> okay, so the Sanza Rebbe, of course everybody knows the Sanza Rebbe is one of the great Rebbe's. Just as a side note of the Sanza Rebbe, um, he, he had a problem walking. I think he even, I'm not sure if he had his leg amputated in the end or something along those lines. Like he, ha he had surgery on his leg and he had a problem with his leg and he had a cane and he was known to hit people with his cane. It's like somebody would come and say, um, you know, I need a bracha for getting married. He's like, okay, say that again, bring your head a little closer and like, pow, hit him with the cane. And then somehow it made some miracle happen. So the sons of Rebbe, so, yeah, he's one of the big Rebbe's. I actually have a whole big section of sons of Rebbe's stories that I'm saving because um, I'm running out of stories. I'm not, I'm not really running out of stories in the world. I'm running out of stories in my piles. <coughs> I'm told like more than 500 stories in the podcast at this point. So it's getting harder and harder every week. But the sons of Rebbe. One of the big rabbis, Rabbi Chaim Halberstam. So he was going around collecting tzedakah, and he went to the house of a wealthy Jew who had given tzedakah before. And he says to him, I'm collecting tzedakah for a worthy cause. And the wealthy Jew says, oh, what, what cause is that? And the rabbi says, it's a worthy cause. You don't have to worry. You can trust me. It's a worthy cause. And he said, rabbi, you know, if you give me a little bit more information, I'll give you more money. How much are you trying to raise? He was trying to raise a very large sum of money, whatever it was, 10,000 rubles. And uh, the wealthy Jew said, listen, Rebbe, if you can tell me <clears throat> who it's for, I'll give you half the money. So he said, I can't tell you who it's for, but I can tell you that it's for a businessman who went bankrupt and lost everything, and I'm trying to help him get back on his feet. So now this guy is really curious, like, I know all the business people, and uh, can you tell me who is the businessman? And the rabbi said, nope, I can't tell you, that would embarrass him, and that's not the purpose of my visit. You can give whatever you want, and we're going to go on our way. And he said, rabbi, if you tell me who it is, I'll give you the full sum of money, all 10,000 rubles. And the rabbi's gabai is there, and he's like, rabbi, this will save us a lot of time, a lot of trouble. Just take the, tell him who it is. It's not such a big deal. And the Rebbe said, the person's honor is more to me than the 10,000 rubles. There's no way that I'm revealing his name. And uh, that's that. And if you want to give, you can give. And if you don't want to give, we'll be on our way because we have more tzedakah to collect. So the guy says, okay, Rebbe, let me talk with you in private. And they go to another room together. And the guy says, Rebbe, I had to test you because I also have lost everything. And I also am about to go bankrupt. And now that you're here, I'm asking you to please help me as well. And I needed to know that you weren't going to reveal to anyone, because if anyone knew that I lost everything, then they would all come and collect the debt, and I'd be in a lot of trouble. So the Rebbe said, okay, got it. And of course, the Rebbe continued going around, collected money for the original rich guy, gave him the money, and collected money for the second rich guy, and gave him the money, and it was only because the Rebbe didn't want to reveal the person's name that these two wealthy businessmen were able to come wealthy again and support the Jewish community.
Okay, well, that's the story for today. Finish a little early, it's not so bad. Um, what are we going to sing at the end here? I guess we're singing the same thing. I lie, la 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 I lie, la 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 I lie, la 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 I remember uh, when Rabbi Shalom would give his lessons. So at the end of the, at the end of the lesson, usually the next morning, he'd come to me in shul and he'd say, "Did I make any sense?" And did anything I say make sense? I said, oh, yeah, I made a lot of sense. Like, I don't think so. <laughs> so it's not the shame I made sense tonight. Shukach to everyone.